Baudet, it's a pleasure to be here. I actually knew and interviewed your husband when I was here as a New York Times correspondent in the 1980s, and, uh, and I'm honored to lecture today in, uh, in his memory. Um, what I'm actually going to do uh, in the next 45 minutes, and we'll save a good 15 minutes for Q&A, is uh, talk about my next book, which was uh, originally, as Boaz said, going to be called Green is the New Red, White, and Blue, uh, which was an idea I hatched a couple of years ago. And um, uh, in the writing of the book, I changed the title. Um, I actually write my books by writing my books. Um, I'm, I'm in this really enviable position, uh, but scary position, that I can actually go to my book publisher and say, I want to write a book. And he says, here's a check. And I say, I, don't you want to know what it's about? And um, uh, he says, no, not really. And, um, uh, and so the, that's really great if you're an author. The bad news is that I can actually start a book with just something on the back of an envelope. Uh, just a kind of gut intuition, uh, as was this case. And the book actually emerges in the writing. Uh, and the book that emerged in the writing is now simply called Hot, Flat, and Crowded. How, why we need a green revolution and how it will revive America. And what this book is really about is the interplay between the whole concept of green and the state of America today, which I'm deeply worried about. And so what I thought I would do is um, uh, do sh two very short readings from the book. The book will be out in September. Um, it's done now and just in the process of publication. I'm going to just read the very introduction of the book, and I'm going to read the conclusion uh, when I'm done. And in between, uh, try to give you a quick summary of what the logic of hot, flat, and crowded uh, is all about. In June 2004, I was visiting London with my daughter, Orly. And one evening, we went to see the play Billy Elliot at a theater in the West End. During intermission, I was standing up, stretching my legs in the aisle next to my seat, when a stranger approached me and asked, are you Mr. Friedman? When I nodded yes, he introduced himself. My name is Imad Tanawi. I'm a Syrian-American working for Booz Allen Hamilton, the consulting firm. Tanawi said that while he disagreed with some of the columns I had written, particularly on the Middle East, there was one column he especially liked and still kept. Which one is that, I asked with great curiosity. The one called Where Birds Don't Fly. For a moment, I was stumped. I remembered writing that headline, but I couldn't remember the column or the dateline. Then he reminded me it was about the new post-9-11 US consulate in Istanbul, Turkey. For years, the US consulate in Istanbul was headquartered in Palazzo Corpi, a grand and distinctive old building in the heart of the city's bustling business district, jammed between the bazaars and the Dome Mosque and the cacophony of Ottoman and modern architecture. Built in 1882 and bought by the State Department 25 years later, Palazzo Corpi was bordered on three sides by narrow streets and was thoroughly woven into the fabric of Istanbul life. It was an easy place for Turks to pop in for a visa, to peruse the library, or engage with an American diplomat. But as part of the general security upgrade for US embassies and consulates in the post 9-11 world, it was decided to close the Palazzo Corpi, and in June 2003, a new US consulate was opened in Istinia, an outlying suburb of Istanbul, 12 miles from the city center. When I arrived in Istanbul for a meeting that year, in 2006, I went to the city center, to the old consulate, and they told me it had moved. 45 minutes out of the city, I hopped in a cab, drove out to Estinia, and there I beheld the new US consulate, which looks exactly like a maximum security prison, without the charm. <laughs> All that was missing was a moat filled with alligators and a sign in big red letters saying, attention, you are now approaching the US consulate in Istanbul. Any sudden movement and you will be shot without warning. All visitors welcome. <laughs> they could have filmed the Turkish prison movie Midnight Express there. But here's another hard truth. Some US diplomats are probably alive today thanks to this fortress. Because on November 20, 2003, as President Bush was in London meeting with then Prime Minister Tony Blair, about six months after the new US consulate in Istanbul had been opened, Turkish Muslim terrorists detonated a truck bomb at the HSBC Bank in the British consulate, 
killing 30 people, including Britain's Consul General, and wounding 400 others. The bomb-ravaged British consulate was just around the corner from Palazzo Corpi. One of the terrorists captured after the attack reportedly told Turkish police that his group had wanted to blow up the new U.S. consulate. But when they checked out the facility in Istinia, they found it impregnable. A senior U.S. diplomat in Istanbul told me more of the story. According to Turkish security officials, the terrorists said the new U.S. consulate was so secure they don't let birds fly there. I never forgot that image. It was so well guarded, they don't even let birds fly there. Mr. Tanawi and I both bemoaned how isolated U.S. diplomatic outposts had become, and we swapped impressions about the corrosive impact such security restrictions were having on foreigners' perceptions of America and on America's perception of itself. Because a place where birds don't fly is a place where people don't mix. Ideas don't get sparked, friendships don't get forged, stereotypes don't get broken, collaboration doesn't happen, trust doesn't get built, and freedom does not ring. An America living in a defensive crouch cannot fully tap the vast rivers of idealism, innovation, volunteerism, and philanthropy that flow through our nation. And it cannot play the vital role it has played for more than 200 years for the rest of the world as a beacon of hope and a country that can always be counted on to lead the world in response to whatever is the most important challenge of the day. We need that America again, and we need to be that America again, more than ever today. This book is about why. The core argument is very simple. America has a problem, and the world has a problem. America's problem is that it has lost its way in recent years, partly because of 9-11 and partly because of the bad habits that we have let build up over the last three decades, bad habits that have weakened our society's ability and willingness to take on big challenges. The world also has a problem. It's getting hot, flat, and crowded. That is global warming, the stunning rise of middle classes all over the world, and rapid population growth have converged in a way that could make our planet dangerously unstable. In particular, the convergence of hot, flat, and crowded is tightening energy supplies, intensifying the extinction of plant and animals, deepening energy poverty, strengthening petro-dictatorship, and accelerating climate change. How we address these five interwoven trends will determine a lot about the quality of life on Earth in the 21st century. I am convinced that the best way for America to solve its big problem, the best way for America to get its groove back, is for us to take the lead in solving the world's big problem. In a world that is getting hot, flat, and crowded, the task of creating the tools, systems, energy sources, and ethics that will allow the planet to grow in a cleaner, more sustainable way is going to be the biggest new economic, intellectual, environmental, and geopolitical challenge of our lifetime. But this challenge is actually an opportunity. If we take it on, it will revive America at home, reconnect America abroad, and retool America for tomorrow. America is always at its most powerful and most influential when it is combining innovation and inspiration, wealth building and dignity building, the quest for big profits, and the tackling of big problems. When we just do one, we are less than the sum of our parts. When we do both, we are greater than the sum of our parts, much greater. But it's not just an opportunity, it's also a test. It's a test of whether we, America, are able and willing to lead any longer. Whether you love us or hate us, whether you believe in American power or don't, the convergence of hot, flat, and crowded has created a challenge so daunting that it is impossible to imagine a meaningful solution to this problem without America taking the lead and being its best. We are either going to be losers or heroes. There is nothing left in between anymore. The days when we could get by by just kind of, sort of, doing the right thing are over. The simple name for the project I am proposing is Code Green. What red was to America in the 1950s and 60s, a symbol of the overarching communist threat 
the symbol that we use to mobilize our country to build up its military, its industrial base, its highways, its railroads, its ports, its airports, and educational institutions, and scientific and military capabilities. We need green to be for today's America. Unfortunately, after 9-11, instead of replacing red with green, President Bush replaced red with code red and all the other crazy colors of the Department of Homeland Security warning system. It's time to scrap them all and move to code green. For me, code green means making America the world's leader in innovating clean power and energy efficiency systems and inspiring an ethic of conservation toward the natural world, which is increasingly imperiled. The first half of my book is a diagnosis of the unique energy, climate, and biodiversity challenges the world faces. The second half is an argument about how we can meet those challenges. I would be less than truthful, though, if I said America, as it is operating today, is ready for this mission. We are not. Right now, we don't have the focus and persistence to take on something big where the benefits play out over the long term. But I believe that could change with the right leadership, local, state, and federal, properly framing how much we have to gain by rising to this moment and how much we have to lose by failing to do so. Americans intuit that we are on the wrong track, that we need a course correction and fast. Indeed, when I think of our situation, I'm reminded of the movie The Leopard, based on the novel of the same name by Giuseppe Tomasi di Lampedusa. It is set in 19th century Italy, a time of enormous social, political, and economic turmoil. The main character is the Sicilian prince Don Fabrizio of Salina, played by Burt Lancaster. Don Fabrizio understands that he and his family will have to adapt if they want the House of Salina to remain its, in its leadership position in the new era where social forces from below are challenging the traditional power elites. Nevertheless, Prince Salina is bitter and uncompromising. We were the leopards, the lions. Those who take our place will be jackals and sheep, he says. The wisest advice he gets is from his nephew, Tancreda, played by Alain Delon, who marries a wealthy shopkeeper's daughter from the new moneyed middle class, and along the way cautions his uncle, if we want things to stay as they are, things will have to change. And so it is with America. The era we are entering will be one of enormous social, political, and economic change, driven in large part from above, from the sky, from Mother Nature. If we want things to stay as they are, that is, if we want to maintain our technological, economic, and moral leadership, and a habitable planet rich with flora and fauna, leopards and lions, and human communities that can grow in a sustainable way, things will have to change around here, and fast. So that's how the book opens. First chapter is called um, Where Birds Don't Fly. And it's about this dynamic, the interplay between an America that has lost its way and a world that has a huge problem. Now let me go quickly through the other chapters just to give you an idea what the argument is. The second chapter of the book is called Today's Date, 1 EC, Today's Weather, Hot, Flat, and Crowded. And what the chapter basically is now about the essential argument here, which is that we are in the middle, I would argue, of a perfect storm of global warming, global flattening, and global crowding. And it is this perfect storm that I believe is the engine, the real engine, driving all the key trends in the world today. Global warming, I don't need to elaborate on. Global flattening is really the argument of the previous book, the world is flat, that the global economic playing field is flattening, and as a result, more people can plug and play, compete, connect, and collaborate than ever before, and what we are seeing is a massive expansion of middle classes all over the world. And the third big trend that's meeting this is global crowding, global population growth. Now, if you go to Google and you put in your birthday, which I've done, July 20, 1953, you can find out how many people were on the planet the day you were born. So if I put in July 20, 1953, what comes up is that there were 2.681 billion people on the planet the year I was born. God willing, I'll eat a lot of yogurt, ride my bike, live to be 100, 
If you also go to Google and go to the UN population table, it will tell you how many people will be here in 2053, when I'm 100. 9.2 billion. That means in my lifetime, in my lifetime, the population of the planet will triple and more people will be born between now and when I die than were here when I arrived. It's getting crowded. And the real vector that I think is actually driving everything is what happens when flat meets crowded. Oh, when flat meets crowded, fasten your seatbelt and put your seat back and tray table into a fixed upright position because every global trend is going to be pushed past the tipping point. I like to give one example. My friend David Douglas, he is the chief sustainability officer for Sun Microsystems. He has a nice example of what happens when flat meets crowded. In the next 12 years alone, the world's population, in the next 12 years alone, is going to grow by another billion people between now and 2020. And many of them will be consumers and producers. When that happens, the law of large numbers starts to kick in. Everything starts to add up to huge. For instance, says Dave, what happens when the newest billion are here if we give each one of them, we just give each one of them one 60-watt incandescent light bulb. Each bulb doesn't weigh much, 0.7 ounces with the packaging, but a billion of them together weigh 20,000 metric tons, or about the same as 15,000 Toyota Priuses. Now let's turn them on. If they're all on at the same time, that would be 60,000 megawatts. Luckily, they'll only use their bulbs four hours a day, so we're down to 10,000 megawatts at any moment. Yikes, looks like we'll still need 20 new 500 megawatt coal burning power plants so the next billion people can turn on one incandescent light bulb. That's what happens when flat starts to meet crowded. Now the trends that these are driving, there are many, but I identify five. And I think these are the five key trends that are going to shape the 21st century. They are climate change, energy and resource supply and demand, petro-dictatorship, Putin, Chavez, Iranians, biodiversity loss, and something I call energy poverty. What the next five chapters are about are each one of these trends. I look at them, each one, in a, in a deeper way. So the first one on energy supply and demand is called Too Many Americans Are Carbon Copies. We are moving from a world not just of 2.6 billion people to 9 billion people, but we're moving from a world of a billion Americans, where a billion people lived an American lifestyle, to a world where 3 or 4 billion people could be living an American lifestyle. Well, if we don't redefine what an American lifestyle is in energy resource terms, we need two more planets. A friend of mine in the book has invented a concept called the Americum. The Americum. And Americum is any 350 million people living like Americans. In, when I was born, there were two and a half Americums in the world. America, Europe, and Japan, Asia. Today, there are nine Americums in the world, heading for 10, okay? There's an Americum in America. There's an Americum in Western Europe. There's now an Americum in Eastern Europe. There's an Americum in China, giving birth to another. There's an Americum in India, giving birth to another. There's an Americum in Latin America. There's an Americum in Southeast Asia. We're going from a world of two and a half Americums to a world of nine Americums. The resource the natural resource implications of that are going to be enormous. Too many Americans. Second chapter on climate change is simply called global weirding. Because we're not going to have global warming. Global warming sounds, oh gosh, the winter will be shorter, the summer will be a little longer. 
Sounds nice, global warming, okay? Especially if you're from Minnesota, okay? We're not going to have global warming, friends. We're going to have global weirding. The weather actually gets weird when you have climate change. Longer droughts, harsher rains, more ferocious storms. What this chapter is about, though, is the question I call, who made it hot? Who made it hot? And this came from a discussion I was having with Nate Lewis, a great energy scientist at Caltech. And it was after Katrina, and I said to Nate, what was it about Hurricane Katrina that so bothered us, so got to us? And he rolled that over in his mind for a minute. And he said, who made it hot? You see, we have introduced so much CO2 into Mother Nature's operating system, we no longer know the difference between an act of God and an act of man. Did we make it hot or did he make it hot? Did we make Katrina or did he make Katrina? We don't know anymore. When I grew up in Minnesota, oh, if we got a warm day in February, we said, what a gift. What a gift. This February, when it was 75 degrees in Washington, D.C., and the daffodils sprouted in our driveway, oh, I don't say, what a gift anymore. I say, did I pay for that gift? Did I make that gift? Or did he make that gift? We don't know anymore who made it hot. That's what this chapter is about. Third chapter is on petro-dictatorship. It's called Filler Up with Dictators. <laughs> and basically, we are involved today in a massive transfer of wealth from oil-consuming countries to oil-producing countries that is going to have enormous long-term implications, particularly for this country. Two in particular I would point to. The first is that we are funding the shifting of the center of gravity of Islam from the Mediterranean to the desert of Saudi Arabia. Islam is moving from an Istanbul, Cairo, urban Islam axis to a Saudi Arabia, Najdi, Mecca, Medina axis. The farther Islam moves away, from Andalusia and the Mediterranean, the more inward, the more retrograde, the more anti-woman, the more anti-modern it becomes. We are funding a long-term shift of Islam, the center of gravity, from the Mediterranean to the heart of the Saudi desert. Second thing we're funding is what I call the first law of petropolitics. And the first law of petropolitics says that the price of oil and the pace of freedom operate in an inverse correlation. Then what I did is I went to Freedom House and I got the Freedom House Freedom Index. Freedom House does a freedom index. Newspapers opened, free and fair elections held, NGOs started, women's groups empowered for countries all over the world. I got them for three countries, Venezuela, Iran, and Nigeria, and Russia, actually four countries. And I simply put the Freedom House Freedom Index on the OPEC price graph. And you know what it looks like? It looks like that. What does that tell you? It tells you that the price of oil and the pace of freedom in petrolist countries, countries that are totally dependent for, on oil for their GDP, that the price of oil and the pace of freedom operate in an inverse correlation. Now you know this anecdotally. When, when oil was uh, $30 a barrel, George Bush looked into Vladimir Putin's soul and saw a good man down there. <laughs> you look into Putin's soul today, you'll see Gazprom, Lukos, Izvestia, Pravda, the parliament, everything he swallowed courtesy of $100 a barrel oil. When oil was $20 a barrel, Iran elected Khatami, who called for a dialogue of civilizations. At $100 a barrel, Iran gave us Ahmadinejad, who says the Holocaust is a myth. 
Friedman's second rule of oil, at $25 a barrel, the Holocaust is never a myth. Okay. That's nonsense you can only afford at $100 a barrel. So the price of oil and the pace of freedom are operating at an inverse correlation, and the result of this is that the fall of the Berlin Wall tide, which we thought was going to unleash an unstoppable tide of free markets and free people, is now being met by a counter tide of petro-authoritarianism, which if this transfer of wealth continues for another decade, is going to fundamentally poison geopolitics. The fourth trend is biodiversity loss. The chapter is called The Age of Noah. It begins in China, in two zoos, where the last two giant soft-shell turtles, freshwater soft-shell turtles, are being preserved by China. One is 80 years old, it's a male. One's 100 years old, it's a female. They're trying to get them to mate. They are the last two. And we are the first generation of civilization that will have to think like Noah and save the last two pairs. Because we are in the middle of a spate of extinctions that is comparable only to when the asteroid hit the Yucatan Peninsula and wiped out the dinosaurs. The rate of biodiversity loss, plants, animals, species of all kind, is now a thousand times the norm. If anything else in the world were happening a thousand times the norm, rainfall, snowfall, HIV AIDS spreads, it would be huge headlines. We don't see it. But basically, we are in the middle of a massive extinction of biodiversity. We are the flood, and unless we become the ark, basically another generation of this, and the only polar bears your kids are ever going to see will be in the Haifa Zoo. Now the last one is something called energy poverty. Uh, this is a concept really I invented for the book, and it refers to the fact that there are actually 1.6 billion people on this planet who have no electricity. One-fourth of the planet, actually more than a fourth of the world's population, has no on-off switch in their life. They have no grid electricity, which I call energy poverty. Netherlands today produces the same amount of electricity as all of sub-Saharan Africa except South Africa. China adds every 10 days roughly one gigawatt of electricity which is as much as all of Africa, except South Africa, added last year. And the question of energy poverty is going to become hugely important in a world that's hot, flat, and crowded. I have a bridge chapter, which is called Green is the New Red, White, and Blue, and it's basically about um, what we need, I believe, by way of a response to this challenge. And very quickly, and we can talk about it more in detail, you need to have a system. If you don't have a systemic response to the dirty fuel system, and the dirty fuel system is a system. It worked really well. Problem was, it was dirty. If we don't invent a clean power system that will enable ordinary people to do extraordinary things, if ordinary people cannot do extraordinary things by way of generating clean electrons, energy efficiency, and conservation, we're cooked. So this chapter really is about how we move from one system to another system, from a dirty fuel system to a clean power system. Now, some people will tell you in political science that moving from one system to another actually has a name. It's called revolution. We need a green revolution. Other people will tell you, that's what we're having right now. We're having a green revolution. Whenever I hear that, I always like to say, really? Really? A, a, us? We're, we're having a green revolution? Really? Have you ever been to a revolution where no one got hurt? That's the green revolution. In the Green Revolution, everyone's a winner. Yeah, 
Uh, Exxon's green, BP's green, GM's green. They put a little cap now on those big Hummers that they make that take flex fuel. Okay, yeah. Oh, that's not a revolution, friends. When everybody's a winner, that's not a revolution. That's called a party. <laughs> We're having a green party. And I have to tell you, it's great fun because I get invited to all the parties, okay? It has no connection whatsoever with a revolution. So the next chapter in the book is called 205 Easy Ways to Go Green. And it's about the phony revolution. And I'll just read you the beginning paragraph of it. It actually begins with a little epigram which my cousin who's here will appreciate. It says, a recent study, I got this off the internet, found that the average American golfer walks about 900 miles a year. Another study found that American golfers drink, on average, 22 gallons of alcohol a year. That means, on average, American golfers get about 41 miles to the gallon. <laughs> Makes me kind of proud. So chapter begins like this. What do you mean we're not having a revolution? But, but, but I just picked up the November 2007 issue of Working Mother magazine at the doctor's office and read the cover story, 205 Easy Ways to Save the Earth. It so whetted my curiosity for easy ways to save the planet that I googled for more. And I came up with the following book and magazine titles in one minute. 20 Easy Ways You Can Help the Earth. Easy ways to protect our planet. Simple ways to save the earth. Ten ways to save the earth. Twenty quick and easy ways to save the planet. Five ways to save the earth. The ten easiest ways to save and green your home. 365 ways to save the earth. A hundred ways you can save the earth. A thousand and one ways to save the earth. A hundred and one ways to heal the earth. Ten painless ways to save the planet. Twenty one ways to save the earth and make more money. Fourteen easy ways to be... <laughs> An everyday environmentalist, easy ways to go green, 40 easy ways to save the planet, 10 simple ways to save the earth, help save the planet, easy ways to make a difference, 50 ways to save the earth, 50 simple ways to save the earth and get rich trying, top 10 ways to green up your sex life, I'm not making this up, okay? <laughs> Vegan condoms and solar vibrators, okay? Innovative ways to save planet Earth, 101 things designers can do to save the Earth, five weird and wacky ways to save the Earth, five ways to save the world, and for those with a messianic streak but who are short of both cash and time, 10 ways to save the Earth and money in under a minute. That's the revolution we're having. Okay, it's a phony revolution that has nothing to do with the real scale of this problem. And my friend Nate Lewis has a very simple way of describing the scale. The world today, currently at any time, is using 13 terawatts, 13 trillion watts of energy. Okay? If we want to prevent the doubling of CO2 in the atmosphere from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and the doubling is basically the red line that most climatologists argue that once we pass it, all the climate monsters will come out from the closet. And by the way, on the way there is not going to be any Metsia either. But the doubling is what you don't want to pass. If we want to prevent the doubling of, the of CO2 in the atmosphere between now and 2050, and also account for India and China growing, okay, it means between now and 2050, we're going to go from a world that uses 13 terawatts of energy to a world that in 2050 will be using 26 terawatts of energy. But if we want to prevent the doubling and still double the amount of energy we're using as a world, it means we have to conserve, between now and 2050, 13 terawatts of energy. We have to conserve exactly the amount of energy we're now using as an entire world. And we have to produce from clean power, non-CO2 emitting power, almost another 13 terawatts. That's the real scale of the problem. This is the biggest industrial project mankind will have ever undertaken since the Tower of Babel. Okay. The scale is something enormous that people don't talk about. Now what the next three chapters are about, I'll go through very quickly, is the real revolution. Uh, and what I do in the next chapter, it's called the Energy Internet, 
when IT meets ET. Because what the real revolution will be, will be an energy internet, where you will have clean electrons fed into a smart grid, fed into a smart home, stored on a smart car, all electric car battery, where every one of your appliances will have an IP device and be able to day trade electrons automatically on your behalf through a smart grid. We can go into the detail of it later, but that's actually what the revolution would look like. The next chapter is called, The Stone Age Didn't End Because We Ran Out of Stones, okay? Which is actually a quote from Sheikh Ahmed Zaki Yamani. And what, the, what, what he meant was, when he told his OPEC colleagues back in 1973, boys, pay attention. The Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. It ended because people invented bronze tools. If we raise the price of energy too high too fast, we will trigger the alternatives. What this chapter is about is why we need a price signal. In America, we need an energy carbon tax that will create the market for innovation that would drive that energy internet system. People say we need a Manhattan project. Nonsense. That is the dumbest thing I have ever heard. We don't need a Manhattan project. We need a market. We don't even have an energy market in America for clean energy systems. Do you know that last year the American dog food industry spent more money on R&D than the entire American utilities industry. We invested more money in pet food research last year than we did in clean power. Oh, but people say venture capital, venture capital. You know how much money venture capital went into clean technology in 2007? Five billion dollars. Do you know how much money went into VC at the height of the dot-com revolution year 2000? 80 billion dollars. If five billion dollars fell off the table in the IT revolution, nobody even bothered to pick it up. Oh, five billion, nah, don't worry about it. Okay. That's what went into green technology last year. That is a huge failure of the market. We have no market, because there is no price signal. And all you have to do is ask the big players, which I do in the book, I go to Jeff Immelt from GE, Chairman of GE, I say, Jeff, when it comes to clean power, are you all in? You know, like in poker, are you all in? He says, no, Tom, I'm not all in. Why, Jeff? Why aren't you all in? Because, Tom, I'm not going to make a multi-billion dollar, 40-year bet on a 15-minute price signal. Oh, he's read his Yamani, too. He knows the oil price goes up. And then the oil price goes down. And he makes a multi-billion dollar 40-year bet, and the oil price goes down, and his shareholders make him go away. So if we don't have a price signal that can actually shape this market, we're never going to get the innovation at scale that we need. Now, the simplest way I can explain this is with um, an example that actually Nate taught me about, Nate Lewis. And it's really a simple way to explain the whole problem. Let's say I invented the first cell phone, and I came to Isaac, president. I said, Isaac, I've invented a phone you can carry in your pocket. He you said, Tom, a phone I can carry in my pocket? Yeah, a phone you can carry in your pocket. He says, I'll take 10. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. He said, well, these phones are going to cost you $1,000 each. He says, a phone I could carry in my pocket? That would change my life. I will take 10. I sell 10 to talk, 10 to Mrs. Modai. I sell 10 to everybody. Six months later, I'm back. Phone's a little smaller, a little lighter. See, talk it's only 750 now. He says, I'll take 20. I'm down the cost volume curve. Now I'm on a roll. Oh, I got all these customers at the Technion. I come back a year later. I say, talk remember that phone I sold you? Remember, it worked out pretty well for you? Worked out great. Got another deal for you. See this light here? I'm going to power that light with solar energy clean electrons. It's going to cost you, though, $125 more a month. He says, Tom, Tom, boy chick, boy chick, remember that phone you sold me? That changed my life. In case you haven't noticed, Tom, we already have light. 
I don't really care where the electrons come from. So unless Minister Modai's successor by a couple generations comes along and says to the president, Isaac, from now on, see that light there? You're going to have to pay $150 more for those electrons because you're now going to pay for the CO2 it's emitting in the atmosphere, the pollution, the troops, you know, that we need to protect it. Oh, then when they tell him it's 150 my phone rings. He says, Tom, remember that solar light for 125 I'll take 10 Then I'm down the cost-volume curve, okay? But unless that happens, the fundamental difference between energy and IT is IT gave you something you didn't have. It gave you the internet, it gave you a laptop, it gave you a million functions that changed your life. The best that the energy revolution is going to give you is the same thing with fewer externalities. And unless we recognize that and face up to it with a price signal, you are never going to get the ET, energy technology revolution. Now, the next chapter after that is called, If It Isn't Boring, It Isn't Green. And I'm a big believer. I know there's a lot of young people here interested in the green revolution. And Lord knows we need innovators and scientists, and that's what I count on the Technion to produce. But this revolution, this revolution is all about who writes the rules. Who writes the rule that that light will be $150 from now on? And if it is, that's why I say, if it isn't boring, it isn't green. If you aren't in there in the lobby halls of Congress in my country writing the rules, believe me, the dirty fuels people are. Exxon, Exxon, they're not on Facebook, okay? All right? They're not in your chat room, okay? They're in your face, all right? They're not on Facebook. They're in your face. They know just where the rules are written and they make sure they're written their way. They do boring. They do boring. And if you don't do boring, you don't do green. Now, the, the next few chapters, I have one on the concept of outgreening. I'm not going to get into that. It's a whole concept I invented, which is basically that outgreening your competition is going to be the next great sustainable advantage. I have a chapter on China, because you can't write this book about, uh, about energy without talking about China. We can talk about that. And then I've got basically the two concluding chapters. The two concluding chapters, the first one is called China for a day, but not for two. And this comes from actually a dialogue I did with Jeff Bimbelt of GE for his management team. And at one point at the end, Jeff got totally frustrated. He said, look, Tom, we need a president who's just going to set a price signal, set the regulations. The whole ecosystem will scream and wail for a month, and then we'll all adjust and the whole thing will take off. I thought about it after and I said to him, Jeff, what you're really saying is if only we could be China for a day. Just one day. Just one day where we could, like China, just from the top, set all the rules. And it's actually more valuable for America to be China for a day than for China to be China for a day. Okay. Because in America, when you pass a regulation, if you don't live up to it as a company, the Sierra Club will sue your ass up to the Supreme Court. Okay? That doesn't happen in China. So the chapter is called China for a Day, but not for Two. And it's about how screwed up we are in America on energy right now. And folks, we're so more screwed up than you realize. Do you realize we passed an energy bill at the end of 2007 where we threw out we threw out the renewable and production tax credits for wind and solar energy, and they still have not been reinstalled into the legislation. They expire at the end of 2008. You couldn't make that up. You couldn't make that up. But that's what we did. We are dumb as we want to be. Dumb as we want to be. And that leads to the last chapter of the book. It's called A Democratic China or A Banana Republic. Because we are either going to be a democratic China, that is, we are going to democratically develop the will, focus, direction, and authority to do the right thing, or we're going to be a banana republic. Oh, no, no, not the Latin American kind. Not the Latin American kind. 
You've heard of the term NIMBY, not in my backyard? Well, the people in the utility business speak about banana. Build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything. And we are either going to be a democratic China, or when it comes to clean power, we are going to build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything. Now let me just read you the last few graphs of the book and we'll end. In the summer of 2007 in Basalt, Colorado, I took part in the 25th anniversary of the Rocky Mountain Institute, one of the country's great centers of environmental innovation. Before the dinner began, inside a huge private horse arena magically converted into a gala ballroom, I fell into conversation about environmentalism in Colorado with my friend Auden Schendler, the sustainability officer for the Aspen Skiing Company. When we finished speaking, I asked Schendler for his business card so I could stay in touch. I just changed my card, he said. Oh, have you moved, I asked. No, Schendler explained he hadn't moved or changed jobs. He had his business cards reprinted because he wanted to change the quote he had on the bottom of his card. My old business card used to have a quote from the biologist and environmentalist Randy Dubois that said, trend is not destiny. Then one day I said to myself, guess what? Trend just might be destiny when it comes to climate. There is nothing stopping us from doubling the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. So I changed my business card. It now has a quote from the late author Charles Bukowski, who was this hard-drinking barroom brawler. In the title of, it's the title of his book of poetry, What Matters Most is How Well You Walk Through the Fire. We have not begun to fight on this, said Auden. I'm going to do it even if I think the odds are long. I am 37. I have a feeling of regret about what we have done so far. I want to live to see us win this. I want to see how this plays out. I used to say this is our children's problem, but the fact is we've got about 10 years to make a difference. So actually, it's our problem. Schindler is right. It really is our problem. We are living at a hinge of history which is going to determine just the way this energy climate era will swing. If we're going to manage what is already unavoidable and avoid what will be truly unmanageable, we need to make sure everything we do from here on helps build a real, sustainable, scalable solution. The clear and easy paths are all closed. All that matters now is how we walk through this fire. So what am I? I guess I'd call myself a sober optimist. I prefer to hold on to both of Auden Schendler's business cards. If you are not sober about the scale of the cha challenge, then you are not paying attention. But if you're not an optimist, you have no chance of generating the kind of mass movement we need to achieve this scale. Now, a eulogy is no way to end a book. But the remarks that Amory Lovins delivered at the memorial service for Dana Meadows expressed so many of my hopes, I can't help but share it here. Meadows, the Dartmouth-based environmental expert and writer, inspired or taught many of my own friends in the Green Movement. She died on February 21, 2001, and Amory's remarks at her memorial service went like this. A biologist, perhaps E.O. Wilson, noted that bees and ants and termites, though not very smart individually, display high intelligence collectively. And then he added, people seem just the opposite. <laughs> Dana was an exception. She was one of those promising specimens that are turning up more and more often in the search for intelligent life on Earth. One of those much higher primates whose love, logic, radical stubbornness, courage, and passion awaken the rest of us to our ability and our responsibility to save the world. She wrote three years ago, by nature, I'm an optimist. To me, all glasses are half full. Yet she didn't shrink from reporting bad news, always blended with encouragement about how to do better. She treated the future as choice, not fate, and she defined with luminous clarity how and what was necessary. She shared Rennie Dubois' view that despair is a sin, so when asked if we have enough time to prevent catastrophe, she'd always say that we have exactly enough time starting now. Two years ago, when emailing an unusually somber column about events that made her weep, she appended the following note as counterpoint. A CEO was having to babysit for his young daughter. He was trying to read the paper, but was totally frustrated by the constant interruptions. When he came across a full page of the NASA photo of the Earth from space, he got a brilliant idea. He ripped it up into small pieces and told his child to try to put it back together. 
He then settled in for what he expected to be a good half hour of peace and quiet. But only a few minutes had gone by before the child appeared at his side with a big grin on her face. You finished already, he asked. Yep, she replied. So how did you do it? Well, I saw there was a picture of a person on the other side. So when I put the person together, the earth got put together too. There is so much to admire about that eulogy. The conviction that the future is our choice, not our fate. That when you put people together, you put the planet together. That there is nothing in the universe quite as powerful as six billion minds wrapping around one problem. And most of all, the best expression of sober optimism I've ever heard. We have exactly enough time starting now. So let me end this book where I began it with us, with America. Professor John Dernbach, the environmental law expert, once remarked to me that in the final analysis, the decisions Americans make about sustainable development are not technical decisions about peripheral matters. And they are certainly not decisions simply about the environment. They are decisions about who we are, what we value, what kind of world we want to live in, and how we want to be remembered. To repeat, this is not about the whales anymore. It's about us. We are the first generation of Americans in this energy climate era. And what we do about the challenges of energy and climate, conservation and preservation, will tell our kids who we really are. Our good fortune is that we are born at a time of enormous prosperity and technological innovation. Our misfortune is that to spread that prosperity and reach new heights of technological development, we can't do it the old way by just mining the global commons and thinking that the universe and nature revolve around us and not the other way around. We need to redefine green and rediscover America. And in so doing, rediscover ourselves and what it means to be Americans. We are all pilgrims again. We are all sailing on the Mayflower anew. We have not been to this shore before. If we fail to recognize that, we will indeed become just one more endangered species. But if we rise to this challenge and truly become the regeneration, redefining green, rediscovering, reviving, and regenerating America, we and the world will not only survive, but thrive in an age that is hot, flat, and crowded. Thank you very much.